はい We will now like to begin the 80th anniversary symposium of Chugu University. How can Asian culture, science, and technology create a life centered world in the post COVID 19 era? In this symposium, we have our visiting professor of Chugu University and also a journalist and a former NHK main caster, also. A person who has served as chairman of Sanyo Electrics in the past, Ms. Tomoyo Nonaka,、uh, has been invited here to facilitate our symposium. For Ms. Nonaka,、uh, she is the representative chair of the Gaia Initiative, an NPO organization, and also a full member of the Club of Rome. And she has been engaged in various activities to solve the world、uh, environmental issues centering around life. So, Ms. Nonaka, please. Thank you. Very good to see you all. First of all, I'd like to say that I'm very much happy and relieved that this symposium is now being able to be held. I was very much worried that it might not be, so thank you for all who has prepared to make this come true. My deepest appreciations. Well, our schedule had been rearranged, postponed, again rearranged. Also, the theme has been changed、uh, several times, and there were a lot of hurdles that we had to overcome. But every time that we saw those impediments, No one、uh, has said,、uh, and we tried not to give up. We tried to motivate ourselves, saying that if we try, probably it'll turn the better way. So, step by step, we've made our efforts, and we were determined that our paths would be open despite the difficulties if we continue the efforts. So, we turned the challenges、uh, into our luck. So, using the Learnings from our past predecessors, I think we were able to make this symposium come true. So, the two、uh, who h a s made this come true to those that we owe great gratitude to, I'd like to send my appreciation. So, to Chancellor uh, Dr. Uh, and uh, also Professor Hayashi, thank you so much, Chancellor Iyoshi, and also Professor Hayashi. So,、uh, be- On the back of Dr. Iyoshi, we have this、uh, poster, and I have a flower in my hand. We've created this、uh, rather scary leaflet. Humans will think in language. So, when we say in、uh, language, global warming, some people may think that, well, warming might be better than becoming cold. However, we use this picture here. This is from、uh, the related to the Club of Rome, where most,、uh, most of 50、uh, professors who have engaged in、uh, creating the big report come on, and the Japanese version was trans,、uh, created、uh, as a translated version. And we use this picture on the、uh, title page, on the first page of the book. We are saying that、uh, global warming is not something relaxing. This is an emergency. If we try to visualize that sense of crisis, that sense of emergency with this picture. So, in the past few years, Uh, or maybe not, past several years,、uh, past、uh, more than 10 years,、uh, several decades, we have been always talking about、uh, the necessity to do something in order to solve global warming issues. But now, this year, COVID 19 has arrived.、Uh, we're not able to see COVID 19, this virus,、uh, we're not able to smell or hear them. Suddenly, it appeared in. Among us, and we had to freeze everything our activities. We had to stay home. We were told not to do anything, not to go outside. So we've experienced this about six months. And during the six months, we were thinking that、uh, for what we have always been just discussing and discussing for the past decades, we now know, we see that after our activities h a s frozen, our earth started to become cleaner. The air is cleaner, water is be- more beautiful, and a better environment、uh, we are seeing. So we find ourselves and we now. See that yes, we have to make our environment better, but what we should do after this COVID period that is one of our th- topics. So, here it says post COVID, but even、uh, during COVID or after COVID,、oh, whatever the term is,、uh, what I wanted to put out here is from here, from where we are, we need to think about how we can better our lives. How we can live better lives. And this is not about a, a academic society's matter of study. This is、uh, a topic for an issue for every one of us living on Earth that should think about. Now, 
uh, Dr. Iyoshi. So we started our title uh, with uh, of the symposium. It's the 80th anniversary symposium. So on this uh, commemorative occasion of Chuba University, we had the symposium. So Chancellor Iyoshi, I think it's the mission uh, of you uh, to challenge uh, many things. So can you start by talking about uh, those uh, challenges that you've been engaged in? Yes, thank you, first of all. Uh, from Chubu University, I'd like to extend my appreciation uh, and welcome to all of you who have come here and all those who are, are participating through Zoom. Thank you very much for participating today. Yes, so for all around the world, there is participants through the Zoom uh, system. So thank you, everyone. For Chubu University, uh, in 1938, uh, we have uh, started uh, in the center of Nagoya City. And two years ago, well, from uh, we started to prepare, uh, and we have started the 80th anniversary commemorative uh, projects. So, as part of the whole package of the commemorative uh, projects, we have uh, received the support of Ms. Nonaka and Professor Hayashi uh, to do a collaboration uh, with the Japan uh, so Japanese Association of the Club of Rome and to hold this international uh, symposium today. So, I very much appreciate uh, all the efforts made. Well, thank you. Because because uh, we were able to hold our headquarter for the Japanese Association here in Chuba University. And it is very an honor for us to be able to hold this kind of a wonderful symposium uh, and in this hall. And I recall that probably was last year uh, for the Club of Rome, the Japanese Association. It was the first time it was set in our university campus. Uh, I think there were talks about where it should be located in, and uh, I remember that uh, people consulted with me. So uh, we uh, suggested that uh, Chubu University could be a venue or a site uh, for the Japanese Association, and Professor Hayashi led the effort to set the association office here in university. The Club of Rome has a very distinguished uh, history, and uh, Chubu University is very much honored to be able to uh, cooperate uh, with uh, the uh, efforts. Thank you also. Well, your challenge, uh, so Professor Hayashi, you are the branch uh, officer, or branch director of the Japanese Association for the Club of Rome, and you are the leader of taking on many challenges and initiatives for the Club of Rome. So now, please talk a little bit about uh, the spirit of Chubu University. In a nutshell, what is the spirit of the university? Well, the motto of the Chubu University will be uh, to, to execute, not just talk about things, but to execute. But uh, of course, in the t world today, uh, we'll have to uh, be uh, also uh, good in explaining too, but we place focus on execution. And the Club of Rome last year had its first founding commemorative symposium at this uh, hall. And the co-president uh, has been invited here. Uh, so we were very much honored uh, to receive uh, their, the participation. And uh, since we received the offer to have the Club of Rome office here in the university, we wanted to utilize uh, the uh, and take leverage of uh, the assets we have here. Well, a uh, one uh, one year old. Uh, Japanese Association and the 80-year-old uh, university has a di very much difference in history, but we just don't want to look at the uh, this uh, in a small area. We want to think from a world perspective how we can share the values that we have with the world. That is what we aspire. Well, thank, I think uh, we started with some kind of a brief introduction, but we have to be careful today mostly about the fact that there are a lot of very important and valuable speakers, and I have to be careful of time management. So I have to be uh, careful about time management. So I'd like to ask you that uh, a year ago, uh, the Club of Rome Japanese Association has been made here. And some, maybe some of the audience, one or two people, might not know about the Club of Rome. So why is it made in Japan? What is the Club of Rome? Can you speak in 30 seconds about the history of the Club of Rome? Well, in 1968, Aurelio Pecci, uh, Italian Aurelio Pecci, well, uh, the Orbetti, he was from, a, uh, he was a vice chairman of a typewriter company, Orbetti. Uh, right, probably the young people nowadays will not know what a typewriter is, but 
uh, Peche, uh, even though he was a, a person in the uh, business field and private company, uh, he has seen that uh, with the current trend, uh, the food will be depleted, resources will be depleted, and human will not be able to exist. So the limit of growth has been uh, published as a report. And after 50 years, uh, we now have published Come On, uh, the new report. And it talks about what Japan should do. Uh, we're focusing on what Japan should do. So up to now, we have been uh, in a Western uh, in the Western-centered world, but that will not be if, uh, able to continue anymore. So the Japanese value or the Japanese need to work, uh, has been coexisting with nature, and we have accumulated that uh, wisdom. So we want to share it with the people of the world. Uh, that is our mission. So you are the president of the Association of the uh, Japanese Association of the Club of Rome. And we remember Mr. Uh, Saburo Okita. Actually, the word uh, sustainable development, we thought that it was coming from the United Nations, but actually this is because of the contribution of uh, Mr. Okita. Uh, you can uh, Google later. If you uh, enter uh, Saburo Okita, you will know, uh, you know he worked on the United Nations and Japanese government. And because of that, the crop of Rome, uh, actually, during the early days, Mr. Okita's contribution was uh, very uh, great. Uh, Dr. Hayashi and uh, uh, myself became the full-time uh, members of the crop of Rome at the same time. And there were only three people, including Mr. Komiyama at the time. And uh, as uh, uh, he was uh, talking about uh, Japanese culture, uh, but uh, we think that, you know, uh, Japanese has a lot to offer. Uh, in Japanese, we call it nature as jinen, and that suggests uh, our view on nature. Nature is not outside of the people. And people are included within the nature, and nature allows us to live. That is the Asian country's views on nature. And uh, Japan has its own unique attitude to consider that uh, uh, people are part of the nature and people is embraced by nature. Uh, we have such kind of uh, civilization, culture, and lifestyle, so uh, we'll be able to send out a strong message to the rest of the world. Uh, that is why we thought that uh, we wanted to start the Japanese Association of Club of Rome. And uh, the, uh, the chancellor said that, that this is great. And Unoka san and Hai san, this is great. Only Japan can send out such a message. Uh, we know that uh, you were at the, at the end of the uh, World War II, only uh, nine years old. I think that uh, you have a strong uh, desire for uh, hope, uh, desire for the peace because of that. It's a very uh, strong uh, message. So. Uh, if you'd like to expand on that, uh, it's uh, best timing for you to talk about that. Yes, lately, recently, I would say, well, if you remember, uh, right after the World War II, there was a chancellor of uh, Tokyo University, and there was a uh, Dr. Nambala, and he said the following quite often. Uh, after the World War II, Japan had to recover quickly, rebuild itself quickly. And the most important thing at that time was to bandwagon with the mega stream of the history. That is to say, we shouldn't counter uh, the a trend of the time that will only lead us to the destruction of the nation. That was his pet idea. And I think he was quite correct. Now, if you apply the same thinking to the present day, what should be our guiding principle as Japan? What do you think would be the mega trend that we should be following as a Japanese people? When we ask this question to ourselves, I think that it should be the eternal peace. That is to say, Japan, unfortunately, is the only country which is victimized by the A-bombs. So we know how disastrous, how horrible it is. Because of that, uh, we are against the nuclear war and the nuclear weapon. And in that area, we think that the Japanese can make the biggest contribution. So this should be a national campaign. A whole Japan should be on that. And uh, if I may, today, uh, am I allowed to speak this long from the beginning? Yeah, that's okay, because this is your university, isn't it? Well, 
sorry, okay, uh, in the world. 2,300 megatons uh, A-bombs are stored in the world. So if you calculate how much it would be, uh, actually uh, the, uh, the 15 kiloton was the A-bomb dropped to Hiroshima. And so uh, that killed about 150 to 200,000 people. So if you extrapolate this number, this means that the, the uh, nuclear power uh, or the uh, atomic uh, weapons uh, can destroy the whole population three times. This is uh, just a waste and just uh, uh, unsustainable. I think that the only Japan can convince how ridiculous it is to the rest of the world. And I think that this is the role of the university. We need to teach this to the students and also the citizens in general. So I think uh, this kind of the message should be uh, sent out from Japan. And I hope that the Chubi University can be a help in that kind of activity or campaign. Well, uh, I think that the nuclear fusion is a specialty how to utilize uh, nuclear power uh, in a uh, productive manner. That was your uh, topic uh, while you were young, and you talked about this importance, uh, the, the non, uh, nuclear non-proliferation treat. Uh, well, the uh, Barnett signed just recently, so three more countries, and then we'll be able to ratify. But unfortunately, Japan is not included. This is also an issue, right? Yes, exactly it is. And at the same time, even if you do not push the nuclear button, as you can see, the Earth is in an emergency status. Uh, we are pushed to the edge or cliff in terms of the sustainability of a life form. So what is the mission? Uh, because you are the president of the Japanese Association of the Club of Rome, you can talk about the mission, uh, which is on our shoulders, or you can talk about the purpose of today's meeting. Well. I think Japan and Asia can offer a lot. For example, regarding natural disasters, recently people say resilience is important. In Western Europe too, flooding and torrential water is happening, but its frequency is maybe only once or twice a year. Here in Japan, we have tsunami and earthquake on top of flooding for tens of thousands of years, we have been experiencing them. How can we live with the nature is a philosophy of resilience itself. It is therefore, it's very much important that we communicate this philosophy to the rest of the world. In our university, uh, we also have some uh, uh, centers which are dealing with the dynamic uh, the nature system to improve our resilience, for example, where is uh, uh, the uh, crowds are now approaching and so forth. Now, after the World War II, uh, we, tend to we started to divide uh, the uh, academia. academia, for example, the economics or uh, the physics or the uh, science and technology, engineering and so forth. However, uh, Chancellor, you are now trying to establish an academy of engineering sciences. This is a graduate school program. Uh, that was about four years ago. And I was looking at the pamphlet, and then I uh, read the documents that talks about the results of this uh, academy of em emerging sciences. I think it's great, because it's no longer the division of labor or uh, reductionism. Uh, we, uh, here at this uh, university, you have such a uh, holistic approach in academia, and that goes beyond the traditional interdisciplinary approach. And so, thank you very much for asking me about the Academy of Emerging Sciences. Uh, one plus one is two. That's not the uh, uh, emergency. Emergency, oh sorry, the emerging sciences. Emergency sciences that ask or expect one plus one becomes two or more, or more than two. Uh, 
The current academia is divided into various fields, and it is based on the reductionism, but uh, there's a lack of uh, perspectives of the holistic approach to the academy. Uh, we have to become a holistic uh, uh, academia. However, we have the silo of the department and so forth, and it is very much important that we get rid of that kind of uh, silos. And as a first step to get there, uh, we establish an academy of emerging sciences to try to see how we will be able to eliminate the silos among different fields of study. Fortunately, the pres uh, former president, uh, Mr. Yamagira, Dr. Yamagira of Kyoto University, also had a similar idea. Uh, uh, they had their own academy, and uh, we have our academy of emerging sciences working together as a counterparty. And we're now working together so that uh, we could create a more holistic approach at our universities. So for Rome and, uh, Club Rome, I think your goal is there as well. Uh, yes, we would like to be a part of it, please. Could that happen? Yes, of course. Well, what was that silence? Uh, those of you who agree with our thoughts, we welcome you all. So this is a new challenge for us today because uh, uh, we're welcoming a lot of uh, experts and candidates, even the candidates for Nobel Prize. And this is going to be the new spark, a new encounter amongst these experts. And uh, when we look at the program of this forum today, we have wonderful speakers on the list, and especially the several speakers are reconnected through Zoom. Some of them have to wake up very early. So can we get hellos from some speakers? Can we get hellos from the speakers? Thank you very much for with us. Thank you. And how about you, Chandran? Are you there? Hello. Hi. <laughs> so I'm waiting for your wisdom. And uh, so uh, great announcement and presentation. OK, Chandran? Konnichiwa. Good to meet you all. And I miss Japan. <laughs> Wish I could be there. Thank you very much. Later. <laughs> See you later. And uh, Dr. Werner Lottengara, are you with us? Unmute. Oh. Unmute, please. Unmute, please. Your microphone is off. <laughs> <laughs> Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yep. I got is it you. Okay, now? okay. Good morning. It's very early in Germany. <laughs> Sorry. For the, for the forthcoming discussion. Okay. And okay. thank you very much for the invitation to participate. <laughs> thank you very much for early bird. Thank you. Talk to you later. <laughs> so, we will be able to get their participation later. So, Professor Waitzenega, are you ready? Um, so this is the book, come on. Professor Weinsecker was in the center of publishing this book. It was published first in Germany and of course in English. And at the Club of Rome in Japan, we participated in publishing the Japanese version very uh, later in last year. This is a burning earth on the front cover. And Professor Weizsteger, uh, he was the prior co-president. So we would like to first hear from the professor sent about the story centering around this common. There are only 100 members of Club of Rome, and this has always stayed 100 members. So with his leadership, this report, what is it trying to advocate towards the future? Please. Well, in a sense, 
we are talking about the emerging sciences as your your academy seems to do and so i'm very uh, honored being invited by chubu university and uh, hope that uh, synergies can emerge between the two institutions thank you very much Thank you. So now uh, we will be zooming back to our hall. And from here, we will first see the video that was uh, from uh, Dr. Weitznecker on his presentation. Dear friends, at the 80th anniversary symposium of the Chubu University, I'm talking about the Club of Rome book, Come On, which was fortunately translated into Japanese. The Club of Rome had its origin in Europe at the time when Western Europe was still a big player. And we had the Italian Aurelio Pecce as the founder and Alexander King from Scotland as his friend. Later, they produced the famous book, The Limits to Growth. It became a mega bestseller I believe 30 million copies were sold. But limits to growth had one particularly shocking message that was the depletion of natural resources, which that's the green curve. But it was wrong. I mean, there were two, two pessimistic mistakes in limits to growth. One I just showed a moment ago, and the other was that the assumption that industrial production automatically increases pollution. This is no longer the case. I mean, in Japan, after the Minamata dis uh, disaster and other such things, they have cleaned up their industry. And then there were a number of topics not addressed in the limits to growth. For instance, climate, sustainability, Anthropocene, the globalization, the rise of China, very important for Japan, the digitalization, and the unbridled power of the financial markets. I mean, in 1972, financial markets were essentially servants to the economy, not dictators. That came only after 1990. So Anders Wickman and I, as the new co-presidents of the Club of Rome in 2012, thought we should create a new big report to the Club of Rome. And we had the pleasure of engaging 38 contributors, including my dear friend, Professor Yoshitsugu Hayashi. So the result was, come on, and an important issue in it is the difference between the empty world in earlier centuries and the full world today. From the empty world originated the adoration of growth, understandable. All our instincts, physical instincts, all languages of the world, the European Enlightenment, population increase, and many other things, all stemmed from the empty world and may have to be modified in the full world, in particular the adoration of growth. So, some of the empty world concepts are now outdated. One example for that, the fishery. Herman Daly, earlier the chief economist of the World Bank, created this distinction between empty and full world. And he said, look, if you want more fish and you live in the empty world, what would you do? More fishermen, more nets, more boats, you have more fish. As simple as that. But if you are in the full world, what should you do? Marine protection zones. And um, permits for fishing, fish farming, and save the female fish because the eggs are, are therein. So, 
a totally different strategy for having more fish. So it's almost the opposite from those that it in the empty world. Now, the three chapters of our book are quite different. The term come on in the English language has two very different meanings. One is, don't be crazy, come on. And the other is, come on, join us. Okay, chapter one is, come on, don't tell me the current trends are sustainable. They are not. Chapter two is, come on, don't stick to outdated philosophies coming from the empty world. And the third one is then practical politics. Come on, join us on an exciting journey towards a sustainable world. So let's go through them. Let's begin with the current trends. I mean, the population increases at the core of the full, full world problems. And Japanese is one of the great pioneers on stabilization of um, Japan. Africa should learn from Japan in this particular regard. From the United Nations Fund for Population Activities, we found this graph. From left to right, you see the population increase in different areas of the world. And from bottom to top, you see the economic success over the last 25 years or so. And there you see on the upper left corner, East Asia. They are the winners. It's the countries which stabilize their population. And the big losers are Sub-Saharan uh, Africa. They have a huge um, impact. Uh, increase of population but economically in a disastrous situation so this has to be in the on the minds in the brains of politicians worldwide well the full world we now call the anthropocene it's 65 years of explosive uh, acceleration on the left hand side you see the um, human economy it's all uh, kind of exponential curves and the green side is the response of nature and here the more means worse means bad like carbon dioxide um, emissions etc one measure of the anthropocene i find particularly embarrassing it's the calculation of the body weights of land living vertebrates and here we uh, calculate that 67% uh, of the land living vertebrates are our slaughter animals, you know, domesticated animals. And 30% is we ourselves, humans. And only 3% is left for wild animals worldwide. Isn't that a scandal? It's totally unsustainable. Our book could also be called Policies for the Anthropocene. Well, the climate horrors are absolutely unsustainable. I don't go into details. And the real scare is the sea level rise. Italy during the last ice age was a lot larger than today. And during the last hot age, it was only half as large as today. And the rise can occur rapidly, like in the eighth millennium before today, with a nearly vertical increase of the sea level. And Asia's vibrant growth centers are mostly at the coast, including, of course, in Japan. So that more or less shows the size of the challenge. And now, come on, don't stick to outdated philosophies. For that, we were very happy about the famous encyclical letter by Pope Francis, Laudato Si. This encyclical names the huge dangers to our common home, to the earth, from the current modes 
of the economy. Brutal competition, acceleration all the time, and ever more consumption and greed. And then we looked, we from the Club of Rome, into the history of modern economics and found out that three, you could have said 20, of the heroes of modern economics today are massively in, misinterpreted and abused to legitimate the destructive growth. Adam Smith, David Ricardo, and Charles Darwin. Well, for Adam Smith, the geographical reach of the markets, the so-called invisible hand, were identical with the reach of the law and morale. That means the markets are clearly within a legal frame. But today, markets are global and the law remains mostly national meaning that markets are blackmailing the states to change the uh, politics so that we have a maximum um, returns on capital, returns on investment. This is modern capitalism. It's not what Adam Smith was saying. And for David Ricardo, capital was not moving across borders. Cap capital stayed in the country, but goods and traders were moving, creating the so-called comparative advantages. That's what he is famous for. But today, capital is racing around the world in milliseconds and is de facto enslaving the real economies of the world. Ricardo would have been very angry seeing this. And for Charles Darwin, you know, I used to be a professor of biology, so I know a little more about Charles Darwin. For him, competition was essentially a local affair. Geographical borders for him were helpful for evolution. And he showed that at the Galapagos Islands, where he saw birds which all were originating as finches. And they were able to evolve in the absence of competition from birds from South America. Like on the right hand side, you see a so-called tool using woodpecker finch, learning to crack a uh, cactus thorn to make its beak longer. In the presence of woodpeckers in South America, finches would never have learned that because woodpeckers have that long beak anyway. Now, economists always want to maximize competition, but according to Darwin, this is wrong. And the Anglo Saxon philosophy mostly means reductionist philosophy that is good at, at dissecting but cannot say much about life, the future, and complex systems. And if we want to understand today's world, we have to talk about life, the future, and complex systems. Reductionist anatomy uh, can kill a rat and opening, but they can't tell anything about ecosystems. Responding to this philosophical crisis, we suggest to engage in a new enlightenment. Enlightenment too, if you wish, for the full world. These are the old heroes of the European Enlightenment. I go, don't go into details. And in the English-speaking world, the Enlightenment is often associated with selfishness, Thomas Hobbes, also Adam Smith, and social Darwinism. Now, Adam Smith was the best of the three. He also had this legal frame around the market. But the most terrible guy was Herbert Spencer. He said, 
the state should not interfere with the market on social justice because evolution will render the state unnecessary because all the poor people would, would be killed because they are less competitive. This is social Darwinism, a brutal and stupid kind of philosophy. And we now say that balance should become a key notion for the new enlightenment, like balance between humans and nature. What I've been saying about the vertebrates is not balanced. It's completely out of balance or between heart and brain. Uh, our science, technology and economics is all about brain. Okay, yeah, that's a good thing. But we also have to have a heart for an amenable uh, political system or between short term and long term. If I'm hungry, I want to eat today and not 30 years from now. But if I talk about climate, I have to think long term. Or between public and private, that's what I said about Adam Smith. Between state and markets, there should be a balance, not the dictatorship by the markets. Or religion and state should be in uh, a balance. I mean, an Islamic state is not an attractive uh, idea, but a state forbidding religion is crazy. Or between feminine and masculine, everybody knows that. And between equity, uh, political equity, and rewards for achievement, both are necessary. Or between speed and stability, again, both are absolutely necessary. So the balance idea, which is strong in Asia and weak in America, should be the core of the new enlightenment. Now, let me give you one example, the balance between innovation and reliability. It's a disaster, in my view, for civilization, if always the fastest is winning. Sometimes tradition and slow and uh, dedication, etc., should be the winner and not the fastest. Well, Western thinking tends to lean to dogmatism. Asian thinking usually celebrates balance. So this is fantastic. That brings me to the third point. Come on, join us on an exciting journey towards a sustainable world. That's half the size of the book, you know, practical politics. And here it's interesting to look at India for a moment. Our friend Ashok Kosla, who was my predecessor as co-president of the Club of Rome, a wonderful man, had created development alternatives and over some 30 years, they created some 3 million sustainable livelihoods or jobs in rural India, all sustainable. It's absolutely fantastic. Looking at the local opportunities, etc. Oh, my our friend Gunter Pauli. Um, he created the term of the blue economy, cascades of energy and matter <coughs> and circular economy. And one example of that is so-called stone paper from waste, dust and sand and plastic waste. You can create pa paper out of that. And several stone paper factory already exist in China. And then sustainable agriculture worldwide extremely important. Like Gunter Pauli, also Hans Herren is a member of the Club of Rome. And together with now Minister Judy Wakungu from Kenya, um, they published Agriculture at the Crossroads, a fabulous book. Renewable energies, extremely important. I was member of parliament in Germany when we introduced the so-called feed-in tariffs law and that 
boosted solar and wind and solar photovoltaics is now cheaper per kilowatt hour than nuclear power. That's amazing. And obviously there are big jumps in efficiency available. The book Factor 5 is also translated into Japanese. We go through the four most important sectors of the economy and always see a fivefold increase of resource productivity is available. And then we make political suggestions also in come on for climate, the so-called budget approach, I'm coming to it in a moment, and the ping pong between energy efficiency gains and energy prices. This is the budget approach. It says that all countries of the world will get identical per capita permits for using the atmosphere, a carbon budget. These are the dotted lines. And um, if uh, the old industrialized countries, the red uh, color, would go by this law, then in 2024 or so, our budget would be gone. But then we would be allowed to trade permits, for instance, with developing countries, that's the green line. And that would make it profitable for developing countries selling permits and rapidly going to a climate neutral situation. I mean, this is the Indian economics minister. He is presently, of course, pushing for um, coal and oil and gas, etc. But if the budget approach was applied, he would immediately shift and say, we now go for energy efficiency and renewables and selling the respective permits to the north, meaning the global south would become richer by joining the North in active decarbonization. The ping pong idea is a different matter. Make energy and resource prices rise slowly in proportion to the documented average efficiency increases. So if the efficiency increases, the price for energy would rise in the same percentage. And this ping pong is a idea similar to what we had during the industrial revolution. At that time, it was not energy efficiency, but labor productivity. If labor productivity rises, the wages would be rising. And that would make more labor productivity more profitable. And these, this ping pong went on and a 20 fold increase of labor productivity was achieved. That's the basis of our wealth. And the new resource ping pong could cause a steady increase, perhaps fivefold of an average resource productivity in 40 years, and perhaps tenfold in 100 years. It would essentially terminate the conflicts between economy and ecology. The new enlightenment is still in the nascent stage. One goal is visible already now. Don't let financial markets dominate the state. Europe and Asia will have to work hard and escape from the Anglo-American dominance with the outdated philosophy. And this is the end of my story and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ernst. Please participate in the discussion later on. So, this is a report contributed by more than 50 experts and academics, but he explained this in only 20 minutes. So this was so rich, so well summarized. And do you think uh, this book price can go down if they buy through Juvo University? Actually not. <laughs> so this book is suitable to store at every house. Anyway, we have our participants from a journalist world. Uh, Mr. Eo is here from Chunichi newspaper. So, uh, Ernst, 
received the honorary uh, doctor's degree at Nagoya University five years ago, and uh, you were the coordinator in celebrating that um, that symposium that celebrated that. So, what did you think of the presentation? Uh, he is uh, very stable. He's always consistent. So, and I think the time is catching up with his uh, uh, assertion. And at that time, the speed of the climate change was not regarded as a crisis yet. And people were not feeling the sense of crisis yet at that time. But with the COVID-19, so a professor of uh, Weizsäcker uh, was emphasizing redesigning. And now with the COVID-19, that redesigning is becoming more and more necessary than before. And this has become more realistic. I'm sure that uh, some people have uh, started redesigning, namely green economy in the UK is one example. So in the world of environmental challenge, people tell you to own the problem. So. This is a situation where you have to be the owner of the challenges. And this has the atmosphere was created with the COVID-19. So COVID-19 is not visible. You can't even smell it. This might be around us. And it could be an infection where anyone can get. That's right. It's not visible. And that is true for CO2, too. But we were not the owner of the challenge. But now with the COVID-19, you have become so familiar with the issues and you can feel it. And, you know, this is so true for the speed and progress of the climate change. We have to act now. And uh, that is the motivation we have. And that motivation has come to the grassroots level as well. So Greta uh, is now 17. And when she was 16, no matter how much she insisted, you know, adults used to say, oh, you should go home, you should go back to school, even President Trump. But with the COVID-19, everyone stay, stay and freeze. Airplanes don't fly anymore. You cannot even drive or walk. You have to stay home. And then now you realize, you know, what your husband looks like. So the relationship at home also is re being reshaped. And this is happening all around the world. So this uh, uh, stay at home is very, uh, implica there's an implication. Um, we were proposing the limits to growth at the Club of Rome, but uh, uh, still, we people thought that the development is to fast at the fastest speed run at the fastest speed. But uh, uh, now we have opportunity to stay at home and uh, think very thoroughly and calmly. And this has become very familiar. I think uh, uh, this issue is very in front of us. So I understand your point, but I'm very busy. I have to work at home. I have some house chores. I'm raising kids. And now this challenge is right in front of us. We have time and we have time to think and you don't even know how to use that time wisely. So, Professor Weizsäcker, this uh, uh, new story to... Uh, he was saying that we need a new story to change the world. And I think this is an opportunity to create this new story. So it is truly the come on. So don't be, don't give me a joke. Please stop. So don't stick to the olden time. That was number two. And the third come on was to join us. And it is really inviting everyone to start together. This is uh, what the professor is emphasizing. So in that sense, we have the experts from all around different academism. And with these uh, experts, we, by, we wanted to refer to the Japanese wisdom and skills. And uh, Professor Weisnegger was saying that before and then now to the state. Now, what is a new story to create a new world by using uh, our wisdom? I think, you know, at the symposium, 
we want to open the first page of the story. And as a journalist, I was very thrilled to participate. In, I want to enjoy this symposium. So you are a journalist. And in order to change the situation in Japan, what do you think the first step we should take? Um, I'm going to ask that question at the very end of the symposium, at the end, so please think about it. Yes, I have a lot to write and a lot to think today. Okay, so thank you very much for that. We wanted to go into the first discussion before the break. Let's start the presentation from different uh, uh, academic experts. So now, first I, I'd like to call upon uh, Professor Yamamoto. You're going to be the top batter. First runner up, so uh, now for you, Thanks to you, uh, we were able to uh, create this uh, set uh, free of charge because uh, when, if there was a awarding ceremony for the Nobel laureates, uh, we were preparing to have a ceremony on the stage and we are utilizing that uh, uh, for our symposium today. So thank you, Professor Yamamoto. And next year, we'd like to hear your, uh, your speech becoming the Nobel laureate next year. Uh, thank you. I hope that comes true. Well, uh, the Club of Rome will always be supporting you and cheering you. Well, uh, you are the expertise is in chemistry, and but for after COVID-19, how we should be moving forward uh, with what kind of thoughts? I think that is the topic of what you're going to be talking about. And the target is ethnicity and the uh, science and technology approach. So Iyo-san was talking about the tech science and technology capability of Japan. And that kind of uh, greatness of our capability was something that uh, we were proud of uh, during the growth age of, in Japan. But in order to uh, move forward in the COVID-19, uh, post-COVID stage, what will be important for us? I We only have five minutes for you. I'm very sorry. But in the five minutes, I hope you can give us some guidance. Well, thank you for the time. Well, basically, what I believe is that for environmental issues and SDGs, challenges. In order to solve these challenges, I believe the science and technology advancement is going to play a big role. That's what I believe. But the conventional way that we approach science and technology is not going to be enough to uh, come up with those solutions for the future. I think uh, I, I have slides uh, provided to show you. Well, a destructive innovation is going to be necessary moving forward. And even if we say this term, destructive innovation, we, well, there are issues uh, that we'll have to solve as quickly as possible. So we'll have to, we know that there are the challenges, specific challenges, and we have to think in specific terms, how is it that we're going to solve those specific issues? So in that sense, uh, when we think we have to think about uh, the future society 20 years, uh, 30 years from now, and what is it that we want to achieve uh, in the far future. So I have this uh, quadrant diagram in front of you. In universities, the research that we do uh, needs to be explained with the quadrant, and it is possible to explain using this quadrant. But, and right now, what we need is the application. By application, what we'll be able to create, what kind of innovation can be created through application? And starting from application, the very important basics, uh, we have to create a bridge to the basics, starting from application. And the basics here is things that uh, the, uh, the theories uh, that has not been discovered yet. Uh, so that is uh, the foundation that uh, is undiscovered yet. So, and in order to discover those basics, uh, the, uh, at the gate is the application. And at the application, we need to understand uh, what kind of challenges that we are going to uh, challenge. And it needs to be explained in simple uh, language uh, on what is it that uh, we're going to uh, solve? What is the social needs that we're going to try to achieve? And how 
with that, uh, how we are going to solve that problem, it, uh, we need to do our research, do our studies, and deepen our studies. And by that, we'll discover many, many things. And from this effort, a new uh, theory or academia or a new uh, learning will be discovered. And that is the very basics of everything. So this approach will be the basics of everything. And going to the next page, uh, I want to stand uh, to stop here and think about our ethnicity. Well, Japanese people are told to be very introvert and uh, are people who value the senses and feelings. When we look at 150 countries around the world, uh, it's said that the, this kind of ethnicity is unique to Japanese and only can be found in Japanese people. And also a uh, distinct characteristic is that there's very few logical people, maybe an unfortunate thing. But when I look, ask around my friends, do you have a uh, logical person around you as your friend? And no one can uh, introduce that kind of person to me. So we have very few logical people in the Japanese community. So we play, uh, value our senses and feelings, but there are a lot of noble winners, noble laureates. And the, I have thought of why is there so many uh, Japanese noble laureates uh, even if there is uh, based on senses and feelings. So I've thought about this. I've talked with the uh, Nobel laureates in Japan, and I find that they just live with their feelings, just with their senses. They're not logical people. This is my direct experience I'm speaking to with them. But with their feeling, with their senses, they create a new area of study. So uh, as I wrote it here, a feeling is something like a car engine and logic is uh, like a map that will show uh, the base or where uh, you are standing and if you don't have a map uh, you'll get lost and Japanese are said to be very introverts and uh, also a, a group base uh, community uh, uh, based uh, character so not individually based uh, type of character if we try to forcefully uh, create a individually based uh, uh, value that will be a big mistake and that's explained in the next slide for the Japanese science and technology it's very interesting thing is that uh, we Japanese don't try to conquer nature with science and technology. So if possible, a Japanese science and technology tries to stand by or stay close to nature, always be together with nature. However, when you look at the Western style science and technology, it, it, relatively speaking, it's more a conquering approach. And when you think about the uh, uh, with cr how Christianity started or with Christianity, uh, in the uh, Bible, at the uh, very end, it says that God commands to, uh, God had commanded man to rule all living things. Uh, but in Japan, the what's uh, believed is that there are uh, eight million gods. Uh, everything has a god uh, with uh, the Japanese thinking. And that's where Japanese science and technology grew. So after uh, losing uh, the war, uh, J Japanese and Germany, uh, these two countries, when you look at the people, they're introverts. And the, win uh, the uh, countries that won, uh, Spain, uh, Italy, uh, US, and China, extroverts uh, are more the characteristic of these uh, the those who won, are they, uh, won after, at the war, uh, World War II. And so there's this big difference. And for also for the Japanese conventional science and technologies, uh, form uh, the basic format is uh, important. And in the Edo period, education was based on reading uh, the analects. And, and you just uh, try to memorize them uh, without even understanding what the meaning is. And many of you here uh, in this room probably learned how to use the abacus to calculate. And when you are, when you get uh, uh, skilled with the abacus, uh, you understand that it's you don't use the abacus to try to calculate the answer. You use the abacus and the answer will come out. So this is the kind of feeling or the approach that the Japanese has. And uh, probably this, uh, well, I've only talked about Japanese, but I think this kind kind of approach or the thinking, the philosophy can be uh, utilized for the world. So that is uh, what I believe. Thank you. I think I'm very encouraged what, what you said. So everyone says that uh, you're, uh, all people around me uh, say that you're unlogical, illogical, but uh, now you're playing value on not being logic. So thank you very much. I'm very encouraged. And later on, I'd like to have a more detailed uh, discussion about your point. Thank you. Okay, next. So talking about the Japanese society, when we were growing very rapidly, we were the 
now the number two richest country with a huge credit. But uh, we have issues of aging society and less children. But uh, we want to turn this into an opportunity in, in the past 10 years. Um, Professor Komiyama is proposing the idea of platinum society. So let us hear from Professor Komiyama. Hello, this is Komiyama. Japan is facing challenges of aging society and energy problems. So it is leading other countries in those challenges. We are struggling with those issues now. However, we, of course, need to solve these issues. But at the same time, because we are our leading and advanced nation with regard to these issues, we will contribute to solve issues of the world when we solve ours. Now, what should we aim at? I believe the vision that human beings should aim at shall be where the world could beautifully sustain itself and realize a high quality society in which all people can achieve self-realization. I define this as a platinum society and have been trying hard, aiming to make this happen. To me, COVID-19 or coronavirus was like a signal that expedited the emergence of this platinum society. In other words, People often say the sense of values have changed before and after the corona, but I believe this post-corona era is the platinum society. For example, those small countries and regions who reacted smartly, they were successful with measures against corona. Luxembourg, in Iceland, in Europe, especially Luxembourg, is located in between Belgium and France, that had a lot of death tolls. Even in such a circumstance, although they, there were infected persons, the death toll was very low, and Iceland was also very successful. And also in Singapore, in Asia, or Qatar, and Oman, in Middle East, or UAE even, number of infected persons were not that small, but in all these cases, death tolls were kept at low level. Even uh, and also in Japan, in Wakayama Prefecture, for example, was successful with its own unique measure. So, in small scale and in accordance with respective situation and medical status in those areas, they dealt with the crisis appropriately and were successful. This is. Uh, what I often call Jiritsu Bunsan Kyochoke or autonomous and distributed cooperation. As long as one realizes this idea, then both democracy and corona countermeasures could coexist. This is a good, good example of that. Japan, so far, have been very successful with the centralized system. But from now on, I think it should shift itself to this autonomous and distributed cooperation. Platinum society is based upon the premise that this autonomous and distributed cooperation exists. Next, with the corona crisis, work from or the large scale freedom of side jobs, online conference, online healthcare, which used to be very slow to progress before, were able to make a big progress. Rush hours in commuting are truly absurd. This has become very clear. Now, talking about the online communication, which is becoming a mainstream in Corona, or well, essence of our lives lie very much upon the interaction and relationships between human beings. So, of course, real interaction is irreplaceable. This is especially true for education, for example. However, 
choice of living spaces and freedom of work style have increased significantly. And if I say more, the freedom of lifestyles have increased. We are far more free than what imagine ourselves to be before Corona. We can try to realize ourselves much more freely. Corona crisis will die down in the near future, maybe in one year or more, maybe. But global challenges, including global warming, is getting worse and worse. And I can feel it myself. Japan has a beautiful four seasons. And it makes me even concerned that this beautiful four seasons might be even destroyed. And typhoons are becoming larger. This also scares us. Corona is transient, but the sustainability of the Earth is a permanent challenge for human beings. As a conclusion, I would like to say that Earth should be able to sustain itself beautifully and affluently. The society which enables self-realization of everyone, in other words, the so-called platinum society, is the society that we should aim at in the post-corona era. I am convinced with this. Thank you very much, Professor Komiyama. Next. Well, so we have a centralized system in Japan, and we have a high level of economic efficiency. That is why we're successful with economic growth. But because of these emerging challenges, the so-called autonomous and distributed cooperation can replace our lifestyles, and then we can have wonderful new opportunities. And I think that was the message, beautiful message of Professor Komiyama. So Professor Hayashi, you know, these uh, uh, economic growth in Japan and the air pollution issues. And with those challenges, with your experience in the society of the transportation, um, I wanted to see your perspective about this, but uh, we don't have enough time. So actually, we can hear from Toyota uh, Motors, who is at the top of or the front line of this auto industry. And uh, we were able to get reference from uh, Professor Hayashi for the next speaker. And the next speaker is Mr. Yaegashi. He was the developer of the hybrid uh, car engine for Prius. And uh, he thought very hard what to do about the catalyst of uh, this Prius uh, hybrid engine. And he was very successful with that. He's retired uh, for a while. But uh, recently, some uh, uh, incidents happened in the auto industry, including the inspection scandals. And so. The challenges around the ethics are becoming larger and larger in that industry, and he's concerned about it. And he's seeking for the solution, the causes and solution for uh, this issue. Can we hear from Mr. Yaegashi now? As a reference for post-corona discussion, I would like to review causes and prevention measures for the environment and safety compliance incidents which occurred frequently in these areas at the highest priority for management of auto companies. In the past half a century, cars have evolved by challenging to overcome negative factors like air pollution and car accidents. And I think we can say that what led to this evolution was the system approach using digital as a tool. On the other hand, I feel that people on the field, in the management, and even in the government are not catching up with the speed of system innovation and digitalization. This is at the background of these incidents. It was the in search for the vision of new global society, the public record of the Club of Rome Tokyo Symposium in October 1973 that I first read about the system approach. 
outline of this record mentioned system approach. Challenges for multi-problematic towards various issues in the current society are very much stimulated by population explosion from environment resource issues and computer study of the challenges for multi-problematic which had strong interaction. At that time, I was working on catalyst system as a member of the Maskey project. Then, later on, by using microcomputer chip that I purchased in Akihabara, I made my own engine computer with the program capacity of 6 kilobyte. After testing with the prototype car from 16 computer chips to hybrid system of gigabyte-sized programs, I spent my time at the forefront of system development. Furthermore, I was involved in the rulemaking, testing methods, engineering development tools, even in lobbying activities and air pollution model research. Throughout this time, I believe I was working at the forefront of the system approach towards multi-problematics of cars in my own style. During the stay-at-home time, I reread books published by Club of Rome, such as Limits to Growth and Come On. The substance of problematic have not changed much to this date from 46 years ago. On top of population explosion, resource issues, global warming, sustainable growth discussions overlap with the current SDGs. It is amazing. However, still to this date, air pollution in cities are not improving, and the pollution in London and Paris are partially caused by clean diesel, which were not clean. After leaving the R&D front, I was involved in incidents, study, and prevention activities. I was disappointed that our challenge were only complacency. I was stunned to find out about the actual situation on the environment and traffic accidents, which were at the background of laws and regulations. Also, I learned that there were lack of understandings about details of regulations and compliance requirements. I was not even it was not even communicated that Japan was ahead of others in challenges problematics. I think behind this was that we got drawn in the ocean of huge volumes of information and numerical data in accordance of, with the fast digitalization. As a result, we forgot that solving issue of people and their society was the basis of corporate or company activities, and this is not only for auto industry. It is truly amazing how fast the system innovation is by digitalization. However, if we understand that digitals are only for people and they are the tools for people to use, they, we don't have to be so afraid. Recently, President Aki of Toyota often talks about viewpoint for the happiness of you other than yourself or other than my stages. Well, thank you very much. So, he talked about how they have uh, uh, counteracted the air pollution starting from uh, the Maskey Act. But at the same time, they had to sell cars under such circumstances when the pressure was getting very high for the air pollution. And uh, now, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Bona Lottengatter. Uh, Dr. Lottengatter is uh, the uh, ex-president for World Conference on Transport Research Society for six years from 01 through 07. Uh, the CO2 and uh, global warming and air pollution, uh, those are the issues which are uh, still with us. And then we now have the COVID-19 falling on us. Transport, transportation and mobility, including the public transportation, and also uh, the uh, airplane. Uh, they are the victim of the COVID-19, but at the same time, they contribute to the pandemic. Uh, so, including those aspects, I would like to ask the Dr. Dr. to make his presentation. Hello, everybody. My name is Vanna Rottengatta, and I will give a presentation on the impacts of COVID-19 on uh, transport, mobility, and logistics. We characterize transport usually as a derived activity necessary to bring people and goods from origins to destinations. But this is only one side of the matter. The other side is emotional feelings and fascination of mobility, which can be best shown by the following picture. 
it shows the development of the automobile from 1888, that was the date of the first ride uh, with an automobile developed motor car and the sports cars of nowadays. And you see uh, that this is not only rational for overcoming distances, this mix of properties, rational functioning and making people happy has to be considered when thinking about the future of uh, mobility and logistics after COVID-19. The transport sector is involved in two ways. First of all, it is actively contributing to the distribution of the virus. And secondly, the transport sector is hit most severely by the impacts of uh, COVID-19 uh, lockdowns. And you see the segments which are most impacted are air transport and public transport by trains and buses with minuses of more than 50%. Uh, while car travel is less uh, affected and two segments are even benefiting, which are parcel service for freight and biking for a short distance passenger transport. It is most important to analyze the change preferences of people. And the surveys show us that people uh, are preferring very much biking and uh, use of on car, while they feel uncomfortable with using uh, public transport, long distance rides with railways and with the airplane. So when it comes to think about the future after COVID-19, we have to think about the feelings of people in this time and this uh, can be studied by two contrasting scenarios for the development of COVID of the time after COVID-19. The first scenario, uh, let me call it roaring the 20s, can be constructed from the historical parallel of the Spanish flu pandemic 100 years ago when 500 million people were infected and more than 17 million died. Nevertheless, the economies also hit by the impacts of the First World War, recovered soon and started a period of social optimism, which we remember as a roaring or golden 20s. And we can learn from this history, which is shown here in, in pictures uh, to the left hand, the time of 1920s and to the right, the time of 2020s uh, situation in the Austrian Alps, in the, in the ski resort uh, after uh, relaxing uh, a lockdown. And we can learn that a quick return to the behavior as usual, combined with thoughtless over-optimism, can lead to a crash. The Roaring Twenties ended with the world economic crisis in 1929. So what about a contrasting scenario, which we could call thoughtful 2020s? This could be constructed under the assumption that people start rethinking their behavior and that producers are rethinking the industrial processes. There are many possibilities for reducing resource consumption in the transport sector without a loss of quality of life or uh, of productivity, which is shown in this list, which I will not present in detail. Let me only present two aspects. The first of all is uh, video communication, which will be increasing and has already been started. And the second is uh, use of more environmentally friendly transportation mode. An example is say, given by the city of Copenhagen, where the biking share in the inner part of the city is already more than 50%. And to the right, you see, this is not a lane for cars. It is a, an express lane for bikes. The European Commission has published the Green Deal Initiative for promoting sustainable economic growth which includes very ambitious measures for the transport sector. In this context, it will be a major challenge to re-establish the confidence of people in public transport. Therefore, a main issue which is left for non-government organizations like the Club of Rome is to convert the unconverted and to convince them that sustainable mobility will increase happiness. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Professor Hayashi. Uh, you also used to be one of the pre uh, president of the WCTRS. After hearing, uh, we can think that uh, really it is true that the pinch can be or the, the uh, risk can be turned into the opportunity. I, I know that uh, uh, you are doing some uh, study in Thailand uh, based on the quality of life as a measure. And unfortunately, we don't have time, so I cannot ask you any question about that. And sorry for that. I apologize to everybody in advance because time is uh, very much limited today. I have to stop you. But anyway, uh, instead of using the traditional reductionism, we need to see the situation uh, from a different perspective. Uh, the, uh, there was a mentioning of the thoughtful 2020s. So you have to be calm because uh, we don't know what would, uh, will be falling on us after COVID-19. There might be other threats. We have to take time. And uh, of course, uh, even uh, without the physical meetings, we can connect uh, with the high tech like uh, Zoom. And therefore, we need to consider our future together with you. I know that uh, you are frustrated. Uh, including uh, Professor Yamamoto, because uh, we don't have much time, but I think that this is going to be a kind of a trigger for everybody to have uh, uh, intellectual uh, exercise. And of course, in the second part, we'd like to have a general QA session. We'll now be hearing uh, Chandran's presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chandran. I'm the founder and CEO of the Global Institute for Tomorrow. I'm honored to be able to say a few words for this uh, significant conference on how can Asian culture, science and technology create a life-centered world in the post-COVID-19 era. I'm based in Hong Kong. So I'd just like to leave you with a few thoughts in the first, uh, in the three, four minutes that I have. The first thing I'd like to say is that we should see ourselves living at the start of the post-Western world, geopolitically, economically, and in terms of how we construct our societies around the world. This is really an important mindset shift that we need to have around the world, and particularly in the Asia-Pacific region. This is an opportunity to redefine the course of human history, given that the 21st century will be a very, very unique one in human history. Uh, why do I say that? Uh, many of you as leading scientists, etc., will understand. But very quickly, it'll be the first time that human population will peak somewhere around 10 billion. Uh, climate change will essentially change the course of uh, human history uh, for the first time in tens of hundreds of thousands of years. Technology has reached a point where it has essentially enabled uh, the altering of human behavior and as well the way in which we live with uh, the natural environment. And finally, we have resource constraints and we have a crisis of an economic model called capitalism. So that requires, in my view, a major rejection of the last 500 years of uh, human history, which has been dominated, and I say this carefully, not to disparage, disparage any of our Western uh, friends, etc., of Western domination. Uh, we in Asia have essentially been the subject of such a domination, and thus uh, our ideas have essentially been shaped uh, through the lens of Western history and Western knowledge and insights. In that process, many of us have essentially relegated our own cultures, knowledge and insights to essentially something that is not as important, and thus lost sight of essentially the great wisdom that has been accumulated over centuries. But this will be difficult. There will be great resistance. Uh, so much has been invested in the world in terms of the way the world operates around Western ideas, both in terms of governance systems, economic ideas, and even value systems. Many of us in Asia are subservient to Western ideas in all areas, including science and technology. And that, I think, is a very important discussion that I hope Japan and other Asian countries will lead to a more honest conversation. Uh, we need to essentially understand that so much of our ideas in this world today seem to be things that we need to monetize. So just because we can do something doesn't mean we should. And that, I hope, will be the subject of the discussion about how Asian
cultures look at the future. We do not need an Asian century, we need a world century. And Japan, I believe, has a special role to play in this, given its unique culture and traditions. Well known around the world, but in my view, at the same time, seen as a bit strange. But I think Japan's strengths uh, can be adopted by many other cultures in the Asia-Pacific region. And re Japan, in that sense, needs to reassert itself. I will humbly say, less so in science and technology, though that will play an important part, but in its value systems. So let me finish by saying uh, the Japanese way is well suited to a post-COVID world. The Japanese way where collective welfare is integrated into everything that the Japanese do and think, uh, which is so different from other societies around the world and particularly the Western world, which helps create cooperative societies. So my last words to you all, the 21st century will be unique. We'll have a post-COVID re reawakening. Will we change? It'll be a post-Western world. Will we understand the opportunity and relearn and reinvent the world away from the Western way of looking at things? And most importantly, I will challenge you all to think about my, uh, my view that the, the rest of this century should not be digital. It should be biological. The future is biological. It's not digital. Thank you very much. So Chandran. Uh there was a big applause, uh, even from the not so many audience that we have in front of us today. Uh, we would like to discuss. Uh, <laughs> I wonder why I was speaking in English, uh, switching back to Japanese. Uh, later on, uh, we will be deepening our discussion uh, for the suggestion or the uh, presentation of Chandran, too. Chandran t uh, was talking about, well, uh, we always talk about in the age of AI, what is, are we going to do? What are humans going to do? Uh, how are, is technology going to dominate us? So a lot of things has been discussed uh, with the uh, development or advancement of technology. But uh, Chandran was saying uh, that, uh, and pretty Professor uh, Kuroda, uh, now uh, it's your turn. Uh, you have to uh, respond to what Chandran has said. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to share the documents through the document share. So this is the title. Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? Uh, there are two points in my message. First of all, in order to solve the privately emergency, we definitely need innovation. But at the same time, in terms of how to utilize innovation, we need the wisdom from local and traditional indigenous cultures. So those are the two points of my presentation today. This is a famous word. And this is the title of the work from 1897 of Paul Gauguin. And uh, there has been a long way from there. Uh, we have the, the development of the science and technology, which have become the part of, of our life. But at the same time, uh, we uh, began to face planetary emergency. And then, uh, oh, what did uh, science and technology uh, teach us? Uh, in terms of the where do we come from, actually, we have more knowledge, for example, to the right hand. You see. Uh, you see the uh, Milky Way and the solar system, and in it is uh, Earth. And then on this planet, Earth, we have our world, and uh, we are connecting uh, the, uh, the various uh, uh, parts of the world, including Chubu University and the participants from other parts of the world. And this is because of the thanks to the, the science and technology. But we have to realize that we are a tiny creature in the big, gigantic uh, the galaxy. And also, not just the human being, but other creatures, and also including the non-living existence, uh, we have a huge system, uh, even the water and mineral, everything is uh, in interconnected. And this is the ecosystem is all about. That was also a learning as a result of the science and technology. Now, this shows the biology calendar Suppose that uh, the emergence of the life is January, and then uh, the Industrial Revolution is really toward the end of the year. So during this uh, time frame, there are many events, and most of which occurred at the end of the, the calendar. And we have to realize that we have to make sure that we don't destroy this uh, ecosystem 
And also, uh, we have to uh, realize uh, the splendor of life and the preciousness of life and dignity of life as we know more and more about the molecular level. So the science and technologies has expanded the knowledge and also changed the way we work. And this shows that the trend of the natural catastrophe is increasing. However, the, uh, the tsunami or earthquake and volcanic activity is not increasing. Uh, others are increasing. Uh, all those others, like uh, meteorological, hydrological, and climatology, uh, those are the human activity derived. Uh, because of the COVID-19, uh, economic activities were down. And uh, on a full year basis, it is going to reduce the CO2 by 8% uh, in this year. And this will be the uh, same as uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius pathway. So you will be able to understand how uh, uh, hurricane uh, uh, it is or how daunting it is to realize a 1.5 degrees Celsius pathway. So innovation is absolutely needed. And I cannot agree more. But uh, 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 the next question you have to consider is how are you going to improve the uh, innovation? SG is so familiar, so I'm not going to go into uh, this area, but it requires uh, international collaboration. We have to fix all those seven uh, targets. We need to uh, realize all seven targets. And uh, I think that uh, there are three things that uh, that would be insightful for us. So that would be very uh, brief, but the first is the Japanese uh, national, uh, Japanese uh, view on nature. For example, uh, there is a deity even in a tree. But uh, this kind of uh, the view on nature can be found in a Celtic culture as well. Uh, it says here the uh, forest and the creatures of the forest as part of the definition of the Celtic culture. And also, uh, you see that that can be found in the Aya's uh, uh, music. And uh, there's, uh, except from the uh, brick face, uh, do not harm the environment, do not harm the water and the uh, flora. This is a great uh, idea of the 18th uh, century before Christ, and then also the science without humanity. This is a word from the Mahatma Gandhi, seven social science. As we try to utilize innovation to solve the art problems, we have to find the clues from those uh, wisdom. So where do we come from? Uh, let's consider and let's uh, uh, ask this question once again. And uh, that requires uh, the deliverance to the nature and deliverance to the life, which is totally different from the current Western philosophy. And of course, uh, the power of use is very much important as we consider the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, it was uh, quite unheard of that uh, you can make a presentation uh, like this in such a short time because you are always energetic, but you, are, you tend to speak long. But this time you are very concise and sharp to the point. Uh, well, uh, the Chandra earlier said that, that this is not the, uh, the era to be dominated by digitization or the AI, uh, but he says that this is going to be a biology. The future is a, t a biology in that context. Uh, he said that the Japan has a great opportunity to make a contribution. Uh, he's uh, the Indian, biologically, and Leiko-san, uh, coincidentally, also talked about the uh, Ligveta, uh, which is from a before Christ 1800. And today, we don't have to go into the details. However, uh, this is one of uh, the holy scripts in India, in Sanskrit. Leko-san, uh, were, uh, were you uh, fascinated by Rick Bader uh, from the days that you were students? Well, not really, but uh, I was uh, uh, looking into the environment and also I was uh, the advisory board member of the SDGs to the UNSG, and then there was a working group called the Indigenous Culture, and so I did a lot of study myself. And I was uh, quite uh, impressed by this uh, uh, insight in the Rick and uh, so I thought that I want to share it with many people. So this is not uh, that I uh, found this just for today, but I uh, have been known for this for a long time, including the seven scenes of Mahatma Gandhi, not from the days of uh, students, of course. Oh, actually, 
uh, Aleko san and uh, myself, uh, who used to be together for a long time, uh, including uh, working for the government advisory uh, committee of various kinds. Uh, and I know that uh, she is one of the greatest mind in Japan. And from here, we are going to get into the culture of, of Asia. How can it make a, a contribution? So, uh, because uh, we want to uh, talk about how can Asian culture, science, and technology create a life centered world in the post COVID 19 era. And when you consider the future, maybe it's uh, quite uh, uh, good to look back historically. The 20th century, of course, that the Western dominated. And also, as Professor Hemamoto mentioned, uh, the, you know, outgoing, assertive, conquest driven people were the winners in the world in the 20th century, and the losers of the worldwide wars were inward looking kind of people, including Japanese. And so uh, during the World War II, uh, inward looking people, including Japanese, were the losers. Uh, it might be too much simplistic to say this, but uh, this kind of a cultural trait difference could be a good idea as we try to solve the current problems like uh, uh, climate and also uh, the food issues and so forth. Maybe the predicament that we're facing is a result of the unilateral dogmatic cultures in the 20th century. So in Asia, particularly in Japan, because the Japanese people are not self-assertive, including students, we are so bad at the self-assertion, but uh, we are comfortable as a uh, with our collectivism. However, I think that uh, when we look at the future, uh, we need to utilize our traits to lead the world to the next generation. So the, now it's uh, uh, the time to give the floor to Professor Tsujimoto. So please tell me about the background of Professor Tsujimoto because it is on the pamphlet. So I feel very responsible for this job. Yes, even Misora Hibari, the famous singer, she sings at the very end of the concert. So you have that role. So Professor Yamamoto talked about how Japanese are introverted. And also Chandran-san said that this is the era of Japan. So they are supporting us, but uh, I don't know how we can uh, meet uh, their expectation. We have a PowerPoint slide, but uh, this is not maybe so suitable for the, today's discussion, so I might have to change my topic. Well, this is my expertise, Edo period after 17th century to the middle of 19th century. This is the time that created or formed the basis of the, the Japanese traits as of now. And then Mr. Kaibara was the one who expressed the common sense in Japan in text. Then furthermore, I would like to explain that uh, the relationship between the human beings and the nature how should we grasp that? I and mean, that is the focus of my talk today. So this will be the focus of my presentation, meaning that uh, how can we involved in nature? Well, in between us and the nature is the body, human body. And with that being the interface, you know, how do we uh, have a relationship with the nature, and I, I would like to explain that. And this is not limited to Japan, but in the East Asia, we have a concept of chi. In other words, in the cosmic atmosphere, it is full of chi. You cannot see it, there's no form, but uh, 
qi is always moving around, and this qi would create lives. It has energy, and it is the foundation of lives. And with the function of qi, everything is created. And in the words of China, it is the uh, earth and the heaven, and we can call it a great Nietzsche in modern language. And with this function of qi, we can create lives. And everything else is created from qi, including insects and animals and grass and plants. They are all the collection of qi. So human beings are also a part of it. All lives fundamentally are the same. And what is the position of human beings then? Well, qi has all the lives, and in this ocean of qi, we are floating, and we are connected with qi even in myself. And the flow of qi is floating on the ocean of this space, and it is connected with ventilation. And we are taking in qi through the means of food. And we're exchanging qi with the external atmosphere. And if, if you st stop um, breathing, then you die. That is how you're connected. And in comparison to the other creature, human beings have a higher quality of qi. That is why we have heart and mind. In other words, mind is the function of qi. This means that the, our body is a collection of qi, and at the same time, we have mind and heart. And because the quality of qi is high, we have a rich mind, and we can think, and we can even have language. And now, shifting my focus to human beings, and as Mr. Kaibara said, once babies are born, and when babies go through growth, they emulate and copy and with that repetition, when that is embodied and being acquired to their body, and then they can freely use those skills. And if I say more, there is a concept of su uh, sudoku, and they would just do a rote memorization uh, of the analects of Confucianism. And that means that they are acquiring these words of uh, Confucian, and they are truly taking it into their knowledge and their selves. And when you look at the human beings, what criteria you use, instead of being human-centered, you should look at human, pe human beings from the viewpoint of nature. And where do we aim at? Well, we aim at the pathway of the heaven and earth and nature. We go in line with that. Instead of insisting your assertion, you merge yourselves with the heaven and earth. That is how you embody yourself with the nature. And in the process, our own bodies, which is a collection of chi, is the interface for us to merge ourselves with the nature. Therefore, we need to improve our body and then organize our body, and that is expressed in the words of Li. In other words, our bodies are modeling the nature. And our minds are becoming better and better through these concepts of Qi. So truly, in the post-corona era, and in this era, truly, this concept, instead of being human-centered, but looking at human beings from the viewpoint of nature, and with that being the basis, we should think about the nature. That's all. Thank you so much, Professor Tsujimoto. Oh, so if people say that, well, that was a spiritual story, I think, you know, in this modern world, people might call your story a spiritual story, but that could happen. However, this word Shizen could be translated to nature in the modern world, but in Edo period, we uh, use the same Chinese character and call it Jinen instead of Shizen, and Ji means yourselves. That's how we understand it. 
and also your what you eat. In other words, your self is formed with the food you intake. And this is true from the perspective of nutrition. But foods, where do they come from? Well, fruits on the tree or fishes in water, they will give us their lives. And on my personal note, when I was living with my grandmother who uh, lived in Meiji era, we, when we started our meal, we used to appreciate the, the, the fact that we were able to eat these food and the lives of those creatures, including the fishes and vegetables. And we say, thank you for giving your lives. So for all the old people like myself, your story was so straightforward. In other words, in Edo period, they had Terakoya, which was a school for children to learn. And also they used to rear children in the town, within the community. So that was more like a common sense. Yes, that is true. Jinen means that it is naturally true. So we don't want to call shizen, but we want to call that jinen. In other words, it is naturally so, even without intention. That's what jinen means, and it's part of our lives. That's think how you could understand it. In the Meiji era, when the Western culture came into our lives, maybe people started to think that, uh, well, we should westernize ourselves, we should cut our hair, and maybe we should cut ourselves from the traditional thinking, this indigenous thinking. Is that what happened? Well, we emulate others and then embody and acquire. And what we did was, you know, emulation was a model of the science in the Western world. But uh, when we think about the Japanese sensitivity, you know, they still exist to this day in a form of DNA. Our sensitivity toward nature, you know, in the Japanese traits, you know, they still exist in a form of DNA. So that's why we can still have hope. Thank you very much. So evolution of human beings could speed up when we are struggling rather than in the time we're enjoying ourselves. That is, I think, part of our DNA. So this is the time where we can express this evolution. And I think this is the opportunity, isn't it? When we launched this uh, Club of Rome Japan, we wanted to uh, communicate and give messages that is unique to us in Japan. And that was the point where we started ourselves. Now, until the time is up, let us do our discussion. So thank you for waiting, Professor Yamamoto. Do you remember what you talked uh, at the very beginning of this round uh, table uh, discussion section? Maybe it's uh, quite a long time ago, but I think it's uh, that what we were discussing is very much in line with what you were talking about. Yes, uh, exactly. For what I've uh, said, I think uh, there were uh, many uh, ways to, uh, many expressions that I've heard of the same thing. So if I can make uh, some additions, additional comments uh, for, Introvert, extrovert it was the word that I used in my presentation, inward looking and uh, outside looking. So uh, there are ethnicity, ethnic groups, uh, many ethnic groups that are outward looking, extroverts, and about the same amount of ethnic groups will be introverts. Israel, for example, uh, Switzerland, uh, Germany, Finland... Uh, probably uh, the citizens uh, there have a similar characteristics to the people in Japan. And basically, I think uh, the in, uh, inward-looking and outside-looking outside uh, perspectives needs to be combined in order to achieve a happiness for humans. Not only uh, inward-looking, but also outside-looking is as, as important uh, as about the same way. But when you look at Japanese people, uh, we are a... Uh, we tend to think more as a group rather than an individual. We like that. It uh, matches us. So we have to go back to that way of thinking for Japanese.
Japanese. So maybe this uh, doesn't sound good to you, but maybe it's about returning to the pre-World uh, War II era. But I think that if we do take that approach, uh, Japan has an opportunity to make another growth and maybe we'll be able to become a model for the rest of the world. Well, that's my very selfish expectation. Well, yes, I agree with you. Like uh, Professor has said, the Terakoya, you talked about the Terakoya, the school for children. Uh, so in there, in the past, the children, they won't understand the meaning, but they will continue to uh, just uh, recite uh, the analects of Confucian. Uh, but that itself, that practice is a wonderful thing, I believe, to learn from the form. And I talked a little bit about calculating with an abacus, and very similar would be uh, the Japanese archery, kudo. And that also, you don't try to hit the target well you will at the end that's but you don't try to do it uh, intentionally but when you practice uh, kudo japanese archery in the correct form then you would naturally hit the target that's the way of thinking i think that is what i was told uh, as what should the what should be thought of when you practice uh, japanese archery i think that's a wonderful culture well i think it's about uh, we that we it's about, uh, maybe we say that we are living uh, on earth, but it's about we are not, we are not living, uh, we are not a living creature on earth, but we are, uh, rather, we are allowed to live uh, on earth. I think that is what you were talking about. I was uh, uh, playing archery uh, when I was a college student, so I understand exactly what you mean. You have to meet the, all the conditions. You have to take the right form in order to hit the target. But if you try to tar hit the target intentionally, then you won't. So I truly understand by experience on what you were saying. Now, Professor Reiko, this discussion that we had from the world of biology, how do you see this? Biology. Well, I think in the history of evolution, so when you study the DNA, from uh, we are share the same uh, see the similar sequences of DNA, 97% with chimpanzees and humans. But there's a big difference. And what's the big difference? When we think about that, I think it's about culture. We humans have culture. Of course, uh, communities, uh, maybe ants have community as well, but uh, the values, philosophy, I think that is what makes us human. And I think that is very common to what you were discussing about. So when we look, uh, if we look at things, probably uh, we won't be able to explain uh, this difference. But when you study biology, when you're practicing biology, that you feel and understand what the difference is. So I think that when you think about what makes human human, uh, I can naturally understand that makes that is the difference. Chen do you have any comment? I have a lot to say, but uh, let me keep it short. And because I don't have a, a serious job like all the other eminent people on this panel, wow. uh, let me just say a few things. I think the, uh, I, the, the point about digital and biology is my way of re-emphasizing the, the current obsession, obsession with digital technology. But the point I really would like to refer to is the discussion about the philosophical discussion uh, several people had about this respect for nature and then referring to ancient uh, books, etc. I would be so bold as to say that at one level, many of these things give us comfort, these old books, but they're irrelevant to today's world. And the irrelevance is not in what they said, but in the irrelevance in the type of world we live in, which is essentially, as Ernst put it, Professor, that uh, we live in a full world. And by that, I mean that in this part of the world, when we talk, when you talk about Japan or ancient, ancient Indians respecting nature, that was essentially within the confines of a very empty world. And within even that empty world, a respect for certain rules and rights and ish freedoms. So the, when I referred to Japan as possibly being a model, 
I was referring to the fact that Japan is, in my view, one of perhaps only two or three societies around the world where certain norms of behavior do not even need to be legislated for people to understand because the collective understanding is so deep. That was how ancient societies also developed, albeit in a less full world. Then what happened, for all the reasons we know, we got into a full world, then we had the Anthropocene and all the things Professor uh, Ernst uh, talked about, and we have this full world. So today we have to deal with the reality of 8 billion people and in countries like India, struggling to essentially have their basic rights met. This is not going to be solved by referring to the Vedas or the ancient books. This is not. We have to now deal with the political economy, and that's the reality. So we can't go back to ancient methods only, but we can, because this conference is talking about Asian cultures, look at the intrinsic notions of those cultures and then revive them and put them into the political economy. So, you know, I can speak for a long time about this, but what I like to say fundamentally, what we're talking about here is, in a full world, uh, in Asia, we talked about Asian, six billion people in 2050, what are your rights and freedoms? And that's the difference, right? Do I have a right to three cars? I have often said car ownership, and I, with all due respect to the people from the automotive industry, is not a human right. So then the issue of going back to ancient times and talking about respect for nature, et cetera, uh, we then start to see that certain things are not rights and freedoms. We do not have those rights. And as we are discovering in the so-called freest country in the world, in the so supposedly United States, there's a complete misunderstanding of freedom because it's based on the individual. There is no respect for the collective. And everything has been framed through economic lens and then ideology that democracy is somehow superior to every other form of political organization. So no one wants to mention China. But last week was Golden Week in China and for those of you who are not aware, 600 million Chinese traveled. How? Because there is a system of essentially collective discipline enforced in ways that you and I may not like, but essentially brings together a, a collective ownership of outcomes. And those are rules. So what I like to argue is that Japan, in my view, is unique you don't need the policemen, you don't need the legislators, the people understand the collective contract they have. And I always say to people who have not been to Japan, just go to Japan, get on the Shinkansen and see how the toilets are. Because the Japanese understand the social contract, you don't need someone to govern that. And so I think in that sense is my point about why Japan, the Japanese way, is the most profound way of thinking, and others need to learn from that. But as some, some of the Japanese speakers have said, the Japanese are not good ambassadors of their unique uh, culture and their unique values, uh, which need to be transposed. Whilst I'm a, I'm a technical person, and I, I be, I'm, I've got a background in science and technology, I would, uh, I would controversially say, we don't need more science and technology in most spheres of human life. We need more science and technology, perhaps in health, in healthcare, as we've seen. But we, what we need innovation in climate change is not about more financial instruments. We need social innovation, which is essentially redefining your rights and freedoms. All Asians cannot have cars, which is taken as norms in Europe and the West. You're not going to fight emissions without restricting human consumption. That is not going to become, that is not going to become, become a reality simply by technical technological innovations. Let me stop there, but I can see you're going to tell Thank me you. to stop. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I know you very well, so thank you very much for stop <laughs> that point. Thank you. Now you have to go, I know. Thank you very much indeed. I, I, can, stay, I can stay for another 15, 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. I've readjusted things. Uh, okay. So I want to speak. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Well, we just had uh, him uh, raising many points, and uh, uh, we don't have enough time to discuss all the points he has mentioned. 
It will take more than three hours. So, Chandra, sorry, uh, we're not going to discuss your points in details today uh, because, uh, well, uh, he raised good points. Uh, that is uh, pre-war time Japan. Well, actually, there was a suggestion that uh, we have to go back to that, and that was uh, what was made, uh, uh, that was uh, uh, written Sorry, that was uh, uh, mentioned by uh, Professor Yamamoto, and I hope that won't be uh, hitting a headline by the people from the Chunichi newspaper today. But anyway, uh, we, when it comes to the laws and progressions, uh, uh, we say that the laws are dictating uh, in Japanese society only 20% of the relationship. The remaining 80% is, uh, is based on the, uh, the uh, relationship that exists in Japan. That's how the Japanese society is uh, uh, working. Even without the uh, legislations, uh, as a group, we Japanese understand what's to be done, what's not to be done. So, for example, going to the court, it is very rare. If you go to the court for filing a case, uh, he, will, he or she will be ostracized in the village or community. It's very unique. And unfortunately, we don't have to talk about this, but uh, this kind of feeling or sentiment, uh, because we cannot uh, uh, leave uh, the community, because we are surrounded by sea, is that because of that the people tend not to stick out or stand out and try to be the same as others? Uh, well, uh, you know the Japanese word dori, which is uh, rational or the logic. Uh, that was a kind of a common sense, and that uh, worked as a kind of uh, laws and regulations. The modern type of laws and regulations became only after the Meiji. And before that, uh, therefore, the distory uh, was uh, used as a, uh, a criteria for the uh, judgment by the court. Uh, so what is this story? Uh, it is a kind of a contract of a, a collectivism society. So it is like uh, uh, the indigenous uh, uh, role or the contract. Now, uh, because of the COVID-19, everybody stayed home because it is a dolly. Uh, this is a self-discipline kind of, of which is coming from a strong community. So there was not uh, law forcing us to stay home, but the people stayed home. But this dolly was uh, eventually lost in our modern days. And uh, we don't know whether this is a good thing or not, but eventually we lost it. In, well, uh, today or yesterday, I know that uh, your book, new book, was uh, published. So uh, what is the title of your new book? Japanese are not logical, but it's OK. That's the title of his new book. Wow, I see. That's uh, quite interesting. A great title. This book is uh, very good as well. Uh, we have simultaneously many issues, including COVID-19, how to cope with the COVID-19 situations, and then what should be the guiding principle that will uh, bring us to the new era. There are many ideas and insights I can find from this book. Now, Yaegashi-san, Mr. Yaegashi, uh, you have been supporting TMC, and although I didn't know, but uh, you were wandering in Akihabara, and without you, uh, we were never able to see the Prius. It was uh, very shocking information. And from you, do you have uh, anything that you'd like to share after listening to the uh, discussion so far? Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, what I wanted to say, there are two things. And uh, the Western or Oriental civilization, that's not what I wanted to talk. I mean, uh, as I said, that uh, the President Akio uh, says that uh, we would like to now have the perspectives of you. That is the perspective of 
other people other than yourself. I said to the end of the presentation, I think I wanted to now restore a good human characteristics. And I close my speech saying that the president of TMC, Toyota Motor Corporation, often says that we need to have uh, the perspective to consider the happiness of others. And this others mean uh, amenable society. And we have to develop the people with skills and wisdom who can consider about others. It's not about the digitization and AI, but uh, the humanity or the human quotient that has to be developed so that we'll be able to overcome the difficult time that we are all facing. That was the message we, I wanted to give you. Uh, the Professor Hayashi, how would you like to respond? Well, I think this is a very, very important point. Uh, well, uh, he started his work uh, by developing the anti-air pollution technology as a catalyst. And then I think uh, I'd like you to ask for more because you were also uh, a, a, from the WCTRS. Afal Chandran also talked about the right to buy uh, the cars. Is it uh, the a part of the human rights or not? That was what was uh, measured by Chandram. And now, uh, because of COVID-19, people are using uh, private-owned cars now more often. But when we think about the entire society, uh, this is about the right to occupy the social public space, including the economic system. And we have to consider uh, what is the price you have to pay in exchange for the use of public space. And also, uh, Dr. Vilna, definitely we need to ask the same question. You, you, you may have uh, opinions. Uh, yes, please. Well, there's a question to me. Well, uh, my uh, feeling is that, say, Turning back uh, to a better harmony with nature is not a national problem which can be exported to other countries. It is an international problem. And we have to respect the cultures of all nations in this sense. That means multicultural approaches are more successful, in my view, compared with uh, exporting national uh, experiences. And how can that be done? Uh, in my view, uh, the intellectual exercises are very valuable, okay? I very much like the limits of growth, and we have used that uh, in academics for a long time. I also like the new messages which are propagated by uh, Mr. von Weizsäcker. But my basic question is, how can we transport that to societies? And we have to look at societies like in the U.S., where 40% of people are not believing in climate change, they are believing in Trumpism. And how can we convert these people, okay, to change their lifestyles and their behavior? This is the main issue in my view. And in Europe, we have a big movement of young people. This has not been mentioned until now. Young people who are fighting for Fridays in, uh, for future, okay? Fridays for future is an uh, environmental movement and the result of this movement of young people is already in Europe, the so-called Green Deal. Without this movement of young people, the Green Deal would never have been decided in Europe. And this Green Deal says, yes, we have to start now with concrete activity plans, and we have to implement these plans now, and not in the future, not in 20 years. And therefore, my view is that we have to support young people, okay, with their movement, with a social movement towards a better future and not so much look to the history. There are positive and negative experience which we can learn from history, but we have to look at the future and have to invest more trust in young people. Donaka-san, can I chip in? Sure. 
Right. So Go ahead. I, I agree, but I would say we cannot see young people as one universal group of people. Most of the young people in the world do not live in the Western world. Most of them do not even have their basic needs met. So in their countries, when we talk about these challenges, it's a very different conversation. So you can be a middle-class, young, educated, uh, young person in Europe or the United States mm -hmm. and talk about all of these things. Uh, but, uh, but at one level, my, my, my view is much of it is superficial because they are still the beneficiaries of a global elite system in which they are top of the pile. But if you then talk about the rest of the world, most of the young people do not even have the basic rights of life. So for them, that is a whole different discussion and their needs are essentially still not what someone in Japan who's a young person thinks about, but someone who's thinking still about, you know, the water, the sanitation, the housing, the basic energy, food supply systems, et cetera. They are the majority of the young people. And that's why, as you know, I even take exception to this view that somehow, you know, uh, we idealize some young woman from Europe as though she speaks for young people in the world. They are elites who represent a small minority who think about the world very different. And, and they have a right to that. But that is not how the large segment of the world lives in. And that's my argument about therefore. In the real world of a crowded world, which Professor Ernst has talked about, most people do not have. And I'll just give you one example and then I'll leave. I'll stop. In a post-COVID world, we'll be in a COVID world, we were talking about hygiene and sanitation. The reality is 80% of the world doesn't have access to what you and I consider safe water. This is not the same as someone living in Europe. So for them, the basic rights come from a very different point of view. And you will know that the provision of basic water and sanitation becomes a major task in some of the countries. Take India, for example. And 80% of wastewater is not treated. So in that sense, the infrastructure, the investments, et cetera, which is why I talk about the political economy, becomes something very different as to be traded off against individuals' rights and freedoms. So that's really the intervention I wanted to make for us to think about this, because we tend to think about the world from the, uh, the, the viewpoint of the privileged. Chandan, thank you for that point. It's very important. And I know now the time you should leave. Okay. <laughs> I will hang on for a little while because I'm so interested. Okay, so Chandran is was made a lot of effort in launching the China Association of Club of Rome. And also, we need a leadership and that so the white people and the Western culture. And then for a long time, the academia, the so-called, the academic world or academic peoples, and those circles as a microcosm of the world economy. You know, those minority in Asia should be, should receive more attention and that is his point. So what we, and Professor Hayashi often say is that uh, it's not that, that we are trying to fight against the Western culture, Western civilization. We are thankful for that. However, because of their civilization, their air pollution and the climate changes, and we need to calmly organize and recognize this fact. And that could be a starting point of a new algorithm. And the first step towards that new algorithm can be taken, and that is how we believe optimistically at the Club of Rome in Japan. So it is the time. Therefore, can you introduce our commentators? We have uh, commentators at the very end. And uh, they said that they can just provide uh, final uh, comments. So. Uh, I'm sorry to have kept you waiting, but can you uh, come closer to our table with your name tags? And uh, we'll be going through our final com comment. So, Ernst, thank you for waiting. 
Professor Weizsäcker. Thank you for waiting. You are the one who had led the Club of Rome up to this day, and you were the person uh, leading uh, the initiative, the uh, changes. I'm sorry that time is so limited, but uh, please do have your comment. Give us. No, uh, so, can you hear me now? Yep, sure. Go ahead. Well, <laughs> as Chandran rightly said, uh, it's not only the empty world or the full world, it's also the poor world or the rich world. And part of the American problem is that for them, human identity is measured in dollars, you know? And this has to be changed. We in Europe are a lot f further than that. Uh, as was said a moment ago, uh, it is impressive, I believe Werner Rottengatter said so, that the young generation is fed up with this counting in dollars only. And this is more European than American. Uh, for us in Germany, for instance, the Atlantic Ocean is a lot larger than the Ural Mountains. We are more Asian than you think we are. Mm -hmm. And so at the, the <laughs> final slide I had was we in Europe and Asia have to get together in order to find what Chandran rightly says, a global kind of perspective, including justice for the poor. Thank you so much. So, Professor Hayashi, I think we're finally going around the f uh, final turn around our uh, fourth corner uh, toward our goal. So right now it's uh, 4.33. Our time is almost up, so I think it's time uh, that we receive commentators' comment. But before that, maybe just a word from everyone. Listening to the discussion today as a first step for today's title, now after with uh, COVID, how can we bridge the future toward the 20, for 21st century for a better future? What is it that we have to do to ha to bridge to the future? So maybe just one word each, uh, starting by Professor Reiko. Well, people who are thinking about this are already thinking about this, but especially for the young generation, I want the young generation to be involved in this discussion. So when you say young, how old are you imagining for like people in their middle school, uh, high school ages? Well, before that, probably they have a lot of influence from their parents, but uh, children uh, in middle school, high school, they're the future generations and they, uh, we want to share new ideas with them and they are going to be the leaders for the new world. And I think that's very important. So that is the mission that we bear. So to share the new ideas with them so that they can be good leaders for the future. Thank you. So next. Um, so, uh, Tsujimoto Sensei, uh, I, now uh, we have to stay at our, uh, go back to our original point and think we shouldn't just stand from th the current position. We have to look into the past future and uh, through the history, you have to learn and uh, uh, think about how we can take uh, responsibility for our future generations to our grandchildren's generations. That is how the perspective that we should have. Well, after lunch, uh, I think we talked with you that we shouldn't talk in, inside of the hall, but we should go outside because uh, it's all about being in the environment of Jinan. Yes, I agree with you. We should not be in a building, but outside uh, in uh, Jinan, the outside environment. And now, Yamamoto Sensei, uh, I've heard a lot uh, of great ideas uh, inside. I am very much, once again, appreciate uh, that I was invited to participate in this conference. I've thought about many topics, and at the very uh, toward the end, there was a discussion about uh, for the people who do not 
uh, who, for the poor, uh, people in poor, what is it that we can offer? Well, I'm a scientist, so I think that it is innovation is necessary from a scientist's perspective. But we cannot just provide innovation, conventional innovation. I think it's absolutely necessary to uh, to. Uh, invent innovation that is completely different to the past. So innovation, conventional innovation, is about uh, a money-based idea. What we can create as something that is uh, worth a dollar uh, value. So the different perspective you're talking about, right. So not about a shareholder's company, but a company should be owned uh, for the employees. That kind of mindset thinking uh, is necessary. And we should keep that in mind as we try to uh, cause, uh, try to uh, have innovation. And the, for the new innovation, I think a Japanese way uh, mindset uh, will be very helpful uh, in the new discoveries and inventions. So not non-logical, more focused on senses, intu intuitions and feelings. Yes. So, and we should also be inside of nature when we think about these things. Well, I always think that for new things, when we see new results, uh, taking an experiment, for example, if we come up with a new result, I think uh, the most important thing is we put ourselves uh, to zero, so in a state of blank slate. When we put ourselves into a blank, empty slate, then we can think, we can see better. So if you're more selfish, if you're thinking so much of yourself, you're not able to see things clearly. If you try to s use words to explain about what you've invented, so being uh, self-centered, uh, when you become, when you tend to become self-centered, you'll never find a good uh, answer or good results. You have have to be transparent and the way to become transparent is very difficult that's the difficulty but as long as you can become transparent you'll be able to make new discoveries and inventions so that's why you're saying we don't have to be logical right thank you and uh, io -san? yes well oh, the first thing i thought about is uh so since you said that it's the first step today I was thinking about what's the new story that we're going to start from today. Well, we'll have to complete this as quickly as possible and definitely. And what we can do, uh, the, everyone has something that we can contribute, what we can do. Someone has said earlier that even if we're journalists, uh, we can just we cannot just stay, say that we're neutral, that we're a more a public uh, a tool. We have to go further close to reality be, and when we see the imbalanced uh, areas, we need to, to take a role to try to recover the balance. As an individual, uh, looking at the body weight uh, distribution of the ver vertebrates on the world, I think I should reduce my weight uh, so that I can give a little bit more share to the other uh, wild animals. So next time when I see you, I hope that uh, I'll check whether you've uh, uh, did, uh, actually did that. Well, Chunichi newspapers, among all of the uh, newspapers, uh, I think uh, you have little, uh, not so much surmising. So uh, I think uh, Chunichi newspapers uh, is highly regarded of. Uh, now, uh, through Zoom, uh, so now to the final commentators. Uh, Professor Kaya, are we connected to you? Do you hear us? Dr. Kaya, I think uh, time is running up, so I'll go. We'll do lady first uh, to uh, Professor Nakanishi. May we ask you to give some final comments, please? Thank you. So, presentations that I heard today were very informative, and it was uh, very diverse. Uh, from the historical viewpoint to looking out towards the future. So rather than making comments about the respective presentation, I would like to talk about my experience from the Islamic world. I don't have a lot of time, so I would like to just make two points. The first point is that uh, I would like to uh, talk about that uh, in Islamic world, uh, they have a tendency to think things holistically. So rather than just breaking things down, they want to integrate things. So it's not the reductionist, but uh, rather it is a holistic view. And the good examples are that uh, I would say the street market 
shows the relationship between people, and they emphasize relationship, and they're trading things other than money and commodity, but the price is also being traded. Uh, some commodities are being priced, but not. If you have a certain needs, then if they realize that uh, you don't have a lot of money and you have a certain needs, then the price will be one-fourth or one-fifth. And if rich people go to that street market, then the price will become five-folds. You, as a Japanese person, might feel that uh, you are being uh, uh, decide, uh, deceived, but uh, actually you are returning things. And then ultimately, it can create a balance and in the end, that commerce makes sense. And also, those traders or the merchants are the collection of the merchants. They're not just trading by themselves. And then they will refer customers to each other or the commodities to each other. In other words, they work side by side. So as Professor Komiyama mentioned, it is similar to the autonomous and distributed cooperation. So I said that they are not breaking it down or seeing the difference, but they are integrating things. And this is shown in the rights of male and female. And from the Western perspective, all rights are expressed in the bar graph and they pursue the equality. However, in the Islam, when they talk about human rights, there might be some ups and downs, but ultimately, they, when they look at the whole life throughout one's living, maybe it's equal. In other words, maybe they inherit the asset only half for female, their life is actually assured or guaranteed. So when you think about it holistically throughout the lifetime, then maybe they are equal between male and female. Okay, I, since because of the time limitation, I want to say that because of this COVID-19, there's one beautiful example that was a result of the corona. I talked with one Muslim in the UK, and it was a story between cremation or buried without the cremation. And in Islam world, uh, cremation is a taboo because you go to the hell. But, and from the perspective of public health, it was better to cremate the dead bodies. However, for Muslims, it is so important in their sense of value without the agreement of the family members. Their family members, when they are deceased, their bodies cannot be cremated without the consent. And then already on the 23rd of March this year, very quickly, the law for this uh, funerals were uh, uh, passed and became the law. So even amongst this different sense of value, in front of the common enemy like uh, COVID-19, uh, we were able to feel the importance of living together by agreeing with each other. Thank you very much, Prof uh, Professor Nakanishi. Now, after Professor Nakanishi, and that was a m Islam world, and in Islam world, there's a lack of enough information, so you, we think it's special. Therefore, we would love to have a different opportunity to discuss the cremation and corona. You know, Chandra talked about how there's a disparity between the haves and have-nots. And now it's the cremation. With corona and COVID-19, you know, it makes us think that some things are taken for granted and some things are not. So how much can you do for the society and for you? I think it was very informative. Thank you very much, Professor Nakanishi. Uh, Dr. Matsuda, thank you very much for your patience for a long time. It's already a quarter before five, uh, but anyway, uh, thank you very much for your patience. Well, thank you. Uh, I was listening to your uh, discussions and uh, I thought that there are many things that I can agree with you. Uh, the first part, the first point is uh, Dr. Weisbeck's uh, presentation. 
uh, he talked about the outline of the common, come on, and he talked about the population explosion in the very beginning. I believe that the biggest of the, the problem that we're facing is uh, the population explosion. Uh, the only one species, a human being, are dominating all the other creatures. And the COVID-19 is the only uh, virus which is not being contained or controlled by human being. But anyway, and uh, later on, uh, I think that uh, it was uh, Chandra Nail. He said that the provision will uh, pick out uh, sometime in 2020s or after 2020s at the Tempidium. Uh, I used to work for the UNESCO. And uh, there was uh, uh, the projection of the population, and it was said that the 9.2 billion in 20, uh, and the 10 billion in 2021. But anyway, the biggest problem is that as you can see, uh, right now, uh, the, if, if the world is uh, burning with the 7.3 billion, uh, if it reaches uh, the 10 billion, what would happen to the Earth? To make, uh, to make sure that we can avoid this uh, earth, a planet burning, uh, we need to wrap our brain so that we'll be able to continue to support the population even if it reaches a 10 billion. And so we need to definitely need to coexist with uh, the planet. And second point I want to raise, I think that uh, this is a Japanese science and technology, which is explained by Mr. Yamamoto, Professor Yamamoto. He says that Japanese science and technology has stand side by side with the nature, whereas the Western version is uh, conquering the nature. And uh, this is not just not uh, for the science and technology, but uh, this difference is uh, li relevant to the uh, culture in general. And when I was working uh, with the UNESCO, I was uh, uh, always trying to respect the diversity and maintain the diversity in culture in various parts of the world. That was one of the important issues for me. And so uh, we continue to have to keep uh, the diversity of the cultures. And also the Western system and uh, uh, the Eastern system. I do agree uh, the uh, Professor Weizke uh, uh, that we need to create a, a hybrid of the two. And uh, there was a mentioning about the successful uh, countries uh, in terms of the controlling and containing the COVID-19, all of the, those countries uh, banned the troubles. However, uh, we were able to be so prosperous because of the international exchange. But now, at the same time, uh, the dark side or the downside was uh, the pandemic. Uh, we believe that uh, in the future we need to restore and uh, promote the international exchange at the same time taking the appropriate measures for the COVID-19. Uh, many countries are now trying to sus uh, sustain both the economic activities and COVID-19 health measures, but at the international level, how are we going to uh, uh, simultaneously achieve the two? I think that this is also a strong homework for us. Uh, sorry, and uh, I hasted. I, I rushed in my... Um, Remark. Uh, now, uh, the, the Professor Kaya, are you with us? Can you hear me? Just a short comment. Can you hear me? Oh, finally, I think I'm connected. I think I was disconnected for all the time. So, I'm sorry we don't have time. Well, now you're connected. Well, I can't see the screen, but I'll make a simple comment. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Well, for I'm the member of the uh, first uh, days of the uh, Club of Rome, and now I'm the honorary member. Uh, that's my position in participating. So listening to today's dis discussion, I feel the change in times. In the time uh, when I was a member of the Club of Rome, uh, like it was written in the book, uh, Limits of Growth, uh, we was talking about limiting growth. But currently, the discussion is, uh, of course, everyone uh, knows about the issues of global warming, and the key is zero emission. 
So I think we are one step advanced. So in order to overcome these issues, we'll need to have the technologies. So these, we, uh, I see a change in times, and we have to understand that times have changed. Uh, so this kind of topic uh, should be good for discussions. I'm sorry I can't see the screen, so I'm sorry you won't be able to see me, but this will be my comment. Well, thank you very much, Professor Kaya. I hope that in the next forum you'll be able to participate in person. Thank you so much. So that brings us to the... Uh, well, I did want to give uh, another round to uh, Ernst and all the other members, but it's the time that we have to stop. Uh, so. Unfortunately, uh, without any summaries, we'll go to the president of Chubu University. Mr. President, uh, please give us a closing uh, a remark. Well, thank you very much. As the chancellor said, that we are celebrating the 80th anniversary this year, and this hall itself uh, is the Memorial Hall, uh, Memorial hall. And uh, what uh, uh, Dr. Miura wanted was that uh, we would become a center of uh, producing uh, the high caliber people that were relevant in the world community. And I think that uh, this uh, symposium uh, turned out to be a significant, significant and insightful event to commemorate our 80th anniversary. We just would like to conclude our uh, closing remark. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much to the present. Well, Nonika, uh, myself, tends to be self-congratulatory, and in spite of my poor chairmanship, however, because of the cooperation of all of you, uh, well, uh, we were able to have many insightful and inspiring remarks. Uh, from the bottom of my heart, I want to thank you to everyone. And to the audience, also, thank you very much. This is really the first step forward. And from the Chubu University and also from the Japan Association of Graphic Prom, we will continue to send out our message. Thank you very much, everyone, for your presence for a long time. With this, we'd like to close. Uh, the 80th anniversary symposium of Chubu University. Uh, today's meeting uh, is going to be posted onto the YouTube. Uh, please check the uh, homepage of the 80th anniversary of Chubu University. Thank you very much, everyone. This ends today's program.